In the last video, we saw how the brain was regionalized with different sorts of information being processed in different areas. But if it's so regionalized, how do its regional outputs get unified? Because they do get unified, no doubt about it. So far as we can tell, all facets of vision, hearing, speech, touch, motion, thought, judgment, and so forth are seamlessly joined together in our conscious minds to a point where we can hardly imagine their ever having been apart. And on top of these regional brain activities come general brain functions like emotions, memory, learned actions, and consciousness itself. These general brain functions, which involve many regional brain activities, get seamlessly coordinated very much in the manner of the regional functions. So, how do all these things get together? Philosophers refer to this as the binding problem. Now, when philosophers refer to something as such and such a problem, it's wise to be wary. It often means that the problem has been around for centuries and refuses to go away. That indeed is the case here. Certainly, I have no plans to present any proven solution to the binding problem in these videos. But brain science has been creeping up on the binding problem as we have progressively learned more and more about the brain and mind, and we have now reached a vantage point from which it is quite easy to see how the brain binds things together in a general sort of way, even though many of the details are still hidden. I will have more to say about this in the videos on consciousness. So how should we start our investigation of all this coordination? Let's begin by looking for one or more coordinating systems. Because brain impulses travel so slowly, one wouldn't expect the brain to hide its coordinating systems in some pocket. Rather, one would expect it to place its major coordinators in a fairly prominent central location so that as much coordination as possible could be done quickly. So let's start on the outskirts and work inward. We begin with the brainstem. If we intentionally exclude some parts atop the brainstem, we found a structure dedicated to relaying messages back and forth from the rest of the brain to the spinal cord. The brainstem also relays messages from the cerebrum to the cerebellum, and it does other fascinating things like activating large parts of the brain in sleep and acting as an on-off switch for various sleep stages and also the waking state. But the brainstem doesn't have the feel of a master back-and-forth coordinator. Rather, it has the feel of an enormous information shunt and switch box assigned important housekeeping duties. So as far as master back-and-forth coordination goes, we can pretty much rule the brainstem out. In that case, what about the cerebellum? The cerebellum has more and deeper furrows than the brainstem, and it has more neurons, nerve cells, than all the rest of the brain and nervous system put together. So clearly... It has lots of data handling capacity. For a long time, people thought the cerebellum coordinated movement. It turns out they were right. But besides coordinating movement, it also coordinates practically everything else, including sensory data, language, memory, and complex thought. If the cerebellum were the master coordinator of all this, then it would indeed be very powerful, and might even resolve the binding problem on its own. But in fact, as far as we can tell right now, its job is much humbler. Its job is merely to fine-tune the coordination being done elsewhere. It is really just the brain's copy editor. So if, for example, one has a stroke in a part of the cerebellum dealing with some specific function, say pronouncing words, then the words would still get pronounced, but they would be pronounced poorly. Thus, in looking for master central coordination, we can pretty much rule the cerebellum out. The next obvious candidate is the cerebral cortex. This is a layer of gray matter, a skin, or cortex, on the outside of the two cerebral hemispheres. But researchers have studied the cerebral cortex long and hard. They are by now pretty much aware of the jobs done by all its varied regions. And while these jobs include lots of regional coordination, 
They include precious little of anything resembling the master coordination we are seeking. So again, in our search for general coordinators, the cerebral cortex pretty much falls by the wayside. If we cut below this gray matter skin of the cerebrum, we come to a land of white matter. This white matter contains axons, long extensions of nerve cells that carry signals to the receptors of other nerve cells. These axons appear white because they are wrapped in a white material called myelin that acts like insulation and allows the signals the axons carry to travel much faster than they would otherwise. So this white matter territory is really a land of cables. And far from being non-vital, a belief that once gave rise to the wrong-headed idea that the brain had space to spare, these cables help the brain to organize its work and to overcome the slow message problem. This explains why most of the two cerebral hemispheres insides are filled with white matter. But within this white matter are impressive collections of gray matter. This gray matter is actually the cell bodies of masses of neurons assembled for a variety of tasks. And it is here, in a double form repeated in both cerebral hemispheres, that we find the brain's master coordinators. One of these structures, a long loopy one called the hippocampus, permits conscious memory recall. Another large group of centrally located internal structures known collectively as the corpus striatum permit the conscious mind to order up complex procedures, procedures that allow the brain and body to perform all sorts of learned actions, everything from writing letters to serving tennis balls. And still another large gray matter structure close to the brain's center, called the thalamus, is the coordinator of consciousness for the senses, and perhaps for other things as well. This picture makes sense. Not only does it agree with a rising tide of brain science information, but it's the sort of revelation where one can say, gee, I should have thought of that in the first place. Because clearly, if brain impulses travel slowly and everything gets processed all at once, then the right plan for fast processing is to set up the sensory and other specialized processing areas on the outer corrugations and to put structures that coordinate the results of this specialized processing in the middle. And while one can argue that the story is not quite so simple, in fact this seems very close to what the brain actually does. At this point it's worth sounding a note of caution. While these coordinating centers in the middle of the brain are important, their role is limited. There is no such thing as a center of consciousness, memory, emotions, sleep, or dreams within the human brain. The entire brain contains memory of one sort or another. Consciousness, as we understand it, can involve almost any part of the brain at any moment. And virtually the entire brain is involved in the workings of emotions, sleep, and even dreams. Nevertheless, these coordinators are important, and the fact that we are coming to understand them is also important. So if you would like to review some startling insights about how they and the rest of the brain do their work, I invite you to view the other videos on this channel, videos dealing with the subjects of memory, sleep, emotions, consciousness, and dreams.